Voice Radio. Believe it. You know it's true. I told him it's a ready birthday. I'm taking this time out to say happy birthday to all my people in Barbados. All my fans, all my loved ones.
just give you a synopsis of what it is. Uh, did he shake his head? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let me read. Professor Henry Fraser, GCN, PSC, Physiology, MD, BS, PhD, Pharmacology, uh, FACP, FRCP is a Bajan, Barbadian, born in the parish of St. John on June 20th. Do you want me to give them that? <laughs> Sir John Collington had the vision 
of exploring and settling the Caribbean coast, which until that time was occupied only by Native Americans who were ignored by the colonists. And eventually, Sir John Colligan and his seven wealthy English people, including the Earl of Shaftesbury, all favorites of King Charles II, the Mary King of England, the Mary King Charles, with the 17 mistresses and 25 children, uh, he gave them all knighthoods, and they all became wealthy and powerful. And so John Colleton organized two expeditions of the Barbados adventurers in the middle of the 1660s. A settlement attempt in 1669, which failed, and a successful settlement in 1670. Seven of the first governors were Barbados, seven of the first eight governors, and until the War of Independence, George Rogers also said that Barbados was the post office for the Carolinas. So the connections were exceedingly strong. And I was invited to come here in 1985 as a result of the visit of the director of the Barbados Tourism Association office of Barbados in New York, a man called Martin Wilson, who came down to Charleston and made this discovery, which most Charlestonians and most Barbadians don't know anything about. Could you pull it up? Pull the mic up a little bit. Okay, thank you. thank you. And so I was invited to come to Charleston to explore the story that the single house of Charleston had been copied from the house style of Barbados. This was the going history, the oral tradition, the architectural view that the single houses of Charleston appeared to have come from Barbados with the settlers in the 1670s. So as a Amateur architectural historian, I was invited to come to Charleston. That's how the connection began. The rest of it is that the, the book, Barbados Garden Connection, was written. Rhoda discovered this book, and Rhoda is as passionate about both Barbados and Charleston as I am. And Rhoda therefore became the emissary, the evangelist, the missionary, who said, Let's tell everybody about this wonderful connection. And so we're here, Penny and I and Bob Fissy photographer are here to launch this wonderful book that you've seen the notices about and Bob's fabulous photograph. So before I get into the lecture, please make sure if you haven't yet been to the City Gallery on the waterfront that you go along to the City Gallery on the waterfront and you see these fabulous photos, some of which I'll show you in the lecture. So, what about the architecture and history of Barbados? I put together a few pictures and I want to take you from the beginning and I want to emphasize some of the similarities between Barbados and the Carolinas and to throw it open to you as to whether there really is a significant historical background that might have influenced the home building of South Carolinians in the first hundred years or possibly even afterwards. And I'm going to start with uh, an outline of the, of the um, themes that I'm going to cover in the 17th century, the period which coincided with the settlement of Charleston and the Carolinas, the 18th century, which is widely called Caribbean Georgian, because the Georgian kings of England uh, reigned during a period when Palladianism was adopted but simplified. The English were simple people, conservative people, so they didn't go for all the grandeur of magnificent columns, but they did conform to the basic principles of Palladian. That was adopted in the sugar wealthy Caribbean and known as Caribbean Georgia. And then the 19th century, and I've labeled that era the post garrison and Gothic revival. The 19th century. The first half of the 19th century was triggered, if you like, architecturally by the British garrison. They built huge buildings, barrack buildings, magnificent buildings, built largely of brick because the slaves used to come via, from Africa, the ships brought the slaves over, lots and lots of slaves packed in like sardines. When the slave trade was abolished in 1807, the ships coming from England had to be settled down lower in the water so they brought the bricks of ballast. And I'm just going to say a bit about the materials of which buildings were built. Because what is terribly important is you have to build the materials that are available. And as we go around the old Charleston, historic Charleston, we see largely brick buildings because you had a city built largely on low-lying, low land, swamp lands. We had a country which comprised coral stone. 
So Carl was still providing the building material. But when the people arrived in Barbados, it was covered with forests. So trees, timber, provided the material. So you can see the transition, the early days trees, and then you cut them down to grow sugar. So you go below the soil and you pick up the coral stone. So that's an important element of the lecture. We come to the post-emancipation period, 1838 onwards. And that's very important, and I'll explain why. And that leads to the consideration of the beautiful photographs of Bob Kiss and the book Barbados Chapter Houses. Finally, the Barbadian vernacular, influenced by the things that came before, the amalgamation of things that come together to produce an architecture which was so similar over a period of 100 years. And vernacular, of course, the term often used more commonly for speech, but it's used by architects to describe the architecture of the local society. And then finally, the post-World War, 1918 19, to 1950 or 60, and finally, the present. So it's a nice subject to consider, and you are not seeing this terribly well because the lighting is too strong at the front. And I wonder, Rob, if we can lower the front lighting, if we can, without complete darkness, because it tends to blur. What we're seeing here is urban houses in a book by the famous historian Wissere from Jamaica, which shows the thatched roof and the timber, very roughly hewn timber from Jamaica. Jamaica is the land of wood and water, and there's still got vast tracts of forests, and in the early days, they produced their own timber. This is quite unlike the, the, the planks that were used in Barbados, imported from Philadelphia, in the north mostly, and other parts of North America. Here's another similar house from Jamaica, and this one is a wattle and dog house. This is using not the big timber cut crudely, not the log cabin type of North America that you see from the cowboy films, like Abraham Lincoln's birthplace, but the wattle and dog, twigs, literally twigs, held together with whites and with mud. So wattle and dog of the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, and still common in Jamaica when the camera was introduced and the equivalent house in Barbados, the workers' cottage in Barbados, built with pine boards imported and with a roof of cane trash. And what is meant by cane trash? These are the large, dry leaves of the sugarcane plant. Sugarcane is, of course, a grass. It's a giant grass, and the stem that produces the sugar is subtended by large numbers of leaves, long leaves. So when the cane is cut, this leaves a lot of leaves, long leaves, giant blades of grass, and that is used on a house like this as the trash. We also have a palm tree in Barbados, similar to your palmetto. The palm in Barbados, the local indigenous palm is called Pocatrinax barbadensis, described several hundred years ago and given the name barbadensis because it's indigenous to Barbados. So that is used also as a thatch. So this is the simple wooden house of Barbados of the, of the very early era with a thatch, with a king thatch roof. And what I want you to notice about this house, in between these ladies standing here, the long end of the house is on the left of your picture, and the lady is standing between a window on her left, in the middle of the picture, and the, and the doorway. And beyond is another window. This is a house with a symmetrical window and door. The door is in the center, the windows are on either side. And that symmetry is an essential part of every Barbadian house almost up until the Second World War. Now let's go back a bit. The book Bridgetown in 1693. This is a wonderful, wonderful etching which appears to have been taken from one of the 200 or ships, 200 or so ships that tended to occupy the very, very busy harbor of Carland Bay outside of Bridgetown. And I haven't blown this picture up for you, but what this drawing shows when it is looked at with a magnifying glass is that the buildings of Bridgetown are all uniformly very tall, very narrow buildings, many of which look like this building. Now this building has a curvilinear Dutch gate. It has only two bays at the gable end of the building. The entry is at the gable end and on the side. 
and the additional signs were almost certainly, the additional doors were almost certainly built to accommodate a shop. And you will notice on the third floor, just like the Dutch gables of Amsterdam opening onto the canals, on the third floor is the warehouse. There's a large door at top. And people ask, as they pass by in Bridgetown, what's a door doing on the third floor? Well, that, of course, was the door to the warehouse in the attic. There would have been a winch, and the goods would have been hauled up on a winch in the attic, to be stored in the attic. I visited the Aitken Rent House today, and I went into the hayloft, and I saw a similar design device where the hay is loaded up onto the upper floor. So here is a Dutch building, because in those days, in the 18, in the 1670s, 80s, and 90s, the British and the Dutch were actually on very, very good terms. Everything Dutch was extremely fashionable in England. And so the Dutch gables were transferred to Barbados. And this coffin picture that you just saw shows dozens of Dutch gables, some step gables, some curved gables. So here it is what is essentially a single house, a single room wide, built on the corner of a building with a Dutch gable and three and a half stories high. And the building next to it, next, is a similar building in the town of Spikestown, another three-story building with an entrance on the main street and an entrance on the side. Three stories, attic, gable windows, a single room wide. This is a very medieval building because it's not even symmetrical. It is 22 feet wide at the street end and only 18 feet wide at the other end because one angle is not, one wall is not at right angle. Uh, when I was a boy and visited this home of friends, there were two balconies, just as we see here, uh, and this building is now restored by the Barbados National Trust as a result of a philanthropist donation, and so the two balconies were restored. Now, to be actually honest, the balconies are an 18, late 18th and early 19th century feature. Both the piazzas, as you call them in Charleston, and the balconies, as we call them in Barbados, are derived from the veranda developed in the 18th century in India, and spread across the world almost. And so the balconies would not have been part of the medieval building. There was almost certainly another building alongside on each side, and that's why, because of the way the blocks were drawn up, that this building isn't even symmetrical, because the buildings were built so close together just like the buildings at Bridgetown. One building packed in next to another with very small spaces in between. So this is an interesting example. And our problem in terms of looking at single houses is that Barbadians, after the Second World War, demolished half the buildings we had. The war was a time of recession, a time of sacrifice, a time when nobody could repair buildings. And many of the large buildings were simply demolished. So you come to Charleston and what do you find? You find buildings that are a single room wide. You find buildings, almost all of them, but a few exceptions like the one on the right which has a big roof, almost all with gable roofs and gable windows and either two or three windows at the gable end of the building. And the old ones didn't have piazzas. The ones with a bit more room had piazzas, the larger house. Now, I know there's a controversy about this. So Years ago, after my first visit to Charlton, I submitted an article to the South Carolina Journal using many of the writings from Charleston about the supposed origin of the single house from Barbados. And my article was rejected because the examples that I could find that I happened to have studied and submitted the architectural drawings, I was told by the this architectural historian who reviewed my article that I had not proved my point. But the connection, I think, is more linguistic than anything else. I don't know how many architects there are in the room. Any architects or architectural historians? Well, in 1647, an Englishman who wanted to avoid going into debtors prison as a result of helping to finance the lost battles of King Charles I, when all of those who put all the money into the royal cause tended either to lose their head or their fortune, came to Barbados to avoid that. And he was a real Renaissance man. 
He understood science of the day, he understood plants and botany, he understood architecture, linguistics, and health. And he went back to Britain and published in 1657 a book that he wrote when he was put into the debtors' prison. The book was a fabulous book, a short history, a short and exact history of Barbados. And in that book he said, the Barbadians never mind which way they build their houses so long as they get them up quickly. And he suggested that there were as hot, he didn't use the word hell, but as hot as hell. And he suggested how houses should be built. He said, if you want a really cool house, then you build a long, narrow house. In other words, he said, a single house, a single room wide, which must not be more than 20 or 22 feet in width, but a single room wide. And you must dispose it so that it looks towards the south and the north. If, he said, you face it towards the east, then it gets all the sun as the sun rises in the morning, and all the sun as it sets in the evening, and it will still be hot. So he wrote very intelligently about how to accommodate your house to the environment and the prevailing winds. But then he said, you know, a single house is going to be cooler, but I much prefer a double house. I love the space, he said, and the large rooms you get by putting two single houses together so that the gable ends meet, the, the, you have a valley gutter, but you are able then with a double house to have much larger rooms. Now, the term single house and double house is in Lytton's book of 1657, 13 years before the settlement of Charleston. Barbadians built houses the way Lytton said to build them. And I can show you when you come to Barbados, the way to perhaps. Many examples. And the term single house and double house exist only in Charleston today and in Liban's book a decade before the settlement of Charleston. There is no architectural book of, in my huge library of architecture, definitions of architectural terms, architectural dictionaries. The terms are not used anywhere else but Charleston. Where did they get the term and the idea of the house, the single room one from? So I leave the case there. You know many of these houses, of course. I love the uh, Monston Alston house. The collections within this most splendid of all the single houses are superb. And I'm going to move on to the plantation houses and show an example of one of the earliest sugar mansions in Barbados. It is not the earliest. A friend of mine lives in a house with a huge marble plaque on the front veranda that says 1653. Uh, this is St. Nicholas Abbey. It wasn't really an abbey, an abbey, that was an affectation. And this was built between 1658 when the owner, the party owner, Mr. Benjamin Berger, returned from his trip to England in 1660. He obviously came back with house plans drawn up with chimneys and fireplaces in the corner of the front reception rooms. Now, in a country which has the most perfect temperature in the world, at this moment, in August, September in Barbados, the temperature reads a maximum of 31 degrees, which is somewhere in the 80s. And in the winter in January, it plummets to the appallingly low temperature of 23 or 24 degrees centigrade which is like the low 70s. And there are fireplaces in this house. So you can see it was built on an English house land without any understanding of adaptation to weather at that time. But it was built of rubble, stone, and brick. And the Dutch gables were fashionable, as we said. Everything Dutch was fashionable in England. Everything foreign is England. Everything you do in America is fashionable in the Caribbean. Everything that comes from England is fashionable in some parts of America, as it certainly was in the colonial era. So this house was built in 1660, and it has a tremendous connection with Charleston. Anyone know? Any hands up on those who own this house? The third governor of the Carolinas owned this house. Sir John Yates was his partnership with the man Berenger. He was his good, good buddy. Berenger had a lovely wife called Margaret. Yemen's lust. <laughs> and Lemons achieved the death of his partner so that he could marry Margaret. And the council 
the council records of Barbados of that year, 1659, suggest that it was said that the Americans had procured the death of Berenger by poisoning and posting spikes down the second town of Barbados from which the old sea three ships sailed to St. Johnston. Well, Yemens was appointed, he was knighted, he was appointed the first governor of the Carolinas. And he took ship in the Odyssey of three ships that came from England with all the supplies that came across the passage of the Atlantic to Barbados, where people come. It's the destination when you take the, the, the trade winds and the ships refueled, uh, revitalized themselves and brought more sailors on board, brought other planters who wanted to come to Charleston to settle, and Governor Yemens came on board. Well, when he got to Bermuda, which was in transit, because there was a hurricane, he was blown to Bermuda, he had second thoughts about Margaret. He said, I'm not sure I can trust Margaret. And he gave the governorship papers over to an 80-year-old who became the first governor. And he went back home to check upon Margaret. <laughs> but being an aggressive man, like all of the early settlers, aggressive, <coughs> ambitious, greedy, wanting to make millions, wanting to make money and return to Britain in that early era, he then decided, no, I want to be governor. So he came back to Carolina. He came eventually to Carolina two years later, seized the governorship, and became, in fact, the third governor of the Carolinas. He didn't live much longer, though. He got his just rewards. He said that he did go home and die in Barbados in 1674, and his widow, Margaret, married somebody else. But this is St. Nicholas Abbey, and it is a place of privilege. My mother happened to be born there in 1911 because her grandfather and his brother had, married, had managed the plantation for 50 years for the expatriate English owners. And the house has now been restored. There's a modern distillery in the old sugar plant. It's a sugar factory has been restored. The National Trust provided the machinery from another factory. And the man who owns it, who is of Barbados, is a very small, incestuous place. The man who bought this is a brilliant architect called Larry Warren, who has restored the house and all the outbuildings. And it is the most complete, and comprehensive, and romantic, historical site you can find anywhere in the West Indies. It's a, a match for a combination of Drayton Hall and Middleton Place. So please go tomorrow, book your ticket. This is something They make a magnificent run. Middleton Place, South Wing. When I saw this, I thought, well, Middleton Place must be in some way influenced by markets. Of course, it's not. As you know, the present house at Middleton Place is the restored and extended flanker to the original mansion. And the, the Dutch gable is anointed here to decorate the, the entrance to Middleton Place is in fact an 1860s extension to the house. So it's not original. There is no relationship to the St. Nicholas Abbey at all. This is another early sugar mansion, however. And St. Nicholas Abbey and this house, Drax Hall, which is still owned by the original owners. You see, people came to the Caribbean. They made their millions of pounds in those early days of sugar. And usually, the descendant, the second or third generation, then often went back to England. The Earl of Harwood in England, for example, the present Earl of Harwood is the eighth Earl, and his eighth ancestor, uh, Henry uh, Lascelles, came to Barbados in the early 18th century, made his fortune, and his son then went back to Britain with all the money, bought a huge farm in Yorkshire, and became an Earl. So much of the wealth of the British, and my principal, Sir Hilary Beckles, spoke here in this hall two years ago when the Barbados comes back to Charleston event, and Sir Hilary spoke a great deal about these amazing, aggressive pioneers who went out to the Caribbean and to the Carolinas to make money and go home and live in luxury. Well, the Draxes went home, second generation Draxes went home, and they still own this property. And the, current, the present, the present Mr. Mr. Drax is about 88 years of age, and he comes to Barbados to inspect his property every January for two weeks. He rents a car and he drives across the country every day to have discussions with his manager. So, but this is a Jacobean house. 
and an architect uh, called Thomas Waterman in 1948 came to Barbados, studied our architecture, and wrote, in his view, this is an architectural historian writing in an architectural review in, 18, in 1948, that there were only three truly Jacobean mansions in the Jacobean style, which means mid, early to mid 17th century, 1620 to 1650. And these were St. Nicholas Abbey and Draxall in Barbados and Bacon's Castle in Virginia. Anyone been to Bacon's Castle? Not quite as famous as St. Nicholas Abbey. Now, moving along, this is another 17th and modified 18th century house. This is Carleton College. And I discovered only today the connect another connection that the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel is actually very strong, was very strong in Charleston, in South Carolina. And it was that society that Christopher Carleton III, a graduate of Oxford and a fellow of All Souls College, left the entire family estates of some 500 acres to provide for a college to train young men in theology, physic, and chirurgery, which is the Latin name for surgery. And in his words, so that being able to cure men's bodies, they would be better able to look after their souls. An extraordinary vision of a will written in 1705, he died in 1710, to produce Christian doctors or medical missionaries, depending on where your priority is. And he wanted his slaves to be treated well. Ironically, a century later, in the 1830s, the slaves of his society were being branded on their foreheads with SPG for the society. Irony. A Christian society, given a set of plantations, acquiring slaves, and a hundred years after Coddington, the Christian benefactor died, they were branding their slaves with the word society. But this is another Caribbean Georgian house, uh, moving on from the Coddington College, which was modified into what we might call Caribbean Georgian. And this is an interesting nuclear house built in 1683 at the center of this much expanded Georgian house. And the interiors have rich plaster work by the man who did plaster ceilings at Windsor Castle in England. And this house is important for several reasons, one of them being that it's one of the houses in which George Washington died. Now, how many people know where George Washington went outside of continental America? Only Barbados? Why? He came to Barbados as a young man of 19 because his brother Lawrence, age 31, had TB. And it was said that he should go to a healthy place. Barbados. Because they thought that only the climate, a good climate, could cure TB. So Lawrence, the half brother, would have inherited Mount Vernon. Young George was to accompany him. They spent seven weeks in Barbados. And they lived in a house that is now called the George Washington. Which the National Trust restored. Penny Heinen was the director of that restoration project. But he died all over Barbados with all of the important people because of his in law connection. And this Warrens is one of the houses he dined at. This is another Caribbean Georgian house. And you can see the lovely triple arcade, typical arches of a Georgian mansion, the pedimented double portico, the uh, <coughs> parapet roof, which is wonderful for protecting. Britons, very important feature of Georgian architecture, which was so readily adopted because it saved the demolition of the house by the hurricane. So that's an interesting house. And this is the Barbados National Trust headquarters, Wildy House, which was bequeathed to the Barbados National Trust. And again, Rich Penny was responsible for directing the restoration thereof. And this is a lovely house because it follows the old English house plan of a central hallway, reception rooms on each side, and lovely triple hung sash windows that you can actually walk through. This is another house at which George Washington died, Highgate House. Again, absolutely pure Georgian. Perfect symmetry, grand entrance with columns, a veranda, and the veranda was probably an early 19th century addition. It would have had the portico and the portico on each side, and the, the veranda is much more a Regency style veranda probably added to this Georgian house. Again, it was George Washington. And I must mention that George Washington came up to Barbados and his biographer, Jack Warren, says George Washington was mainly Barbados. 
because his high society friends introduced him to the fortifications and the necessity <coughs> to defend Barbados against the possibility of all of those uh, French and Dutch that might have invaded. So he visited all the forts and he got very interested in the army. He also got smallpox. What I like to tell my American audience is the small, the mild B9 version of Barbados smallpox, which killed most people in other countries, but in Barbados he survived it. So he came back and when his army was ravaged by smallpox on the Delaware, he was resistant. So he could survive and lead the American War of Independence to victory, just like what might have happened if he hadn't come about this. <laughs> now, I mentioned Sir John Collington, whom I call the founder of the Carolinas. Sir John Collington bought property in Barbados, the sight unseen. He was a wealthy Exeter merchant, and he too was escaping from Britain so he wouldn't lose his head. And he bought property in the northern parish of St. Peter and St. Lucy. And this house is on the site of this property. The family actually sold the house in 1805. And the house is built, I think, on the very early site. And there are dirt cellars in the basement. In parts of the basement, there are dirt floors in the cellars. But this grand Palladian-style house with this lovely fan light and its columns and a, a very symmetrical style have all been added, I think, in two stages in the 18th and possibly early 19th century. But the creme de la creme of this property is the stable. Uh, you're not able to see the full stable because of the entrance walls that would have prevented me from giving you the full view. But this is a gorgeous Georgian Regency stable building with uh, the, the flattened arches and a courtyard with arcades on either side of this beautiful building, which is absolutely pure, untouched, since the Regency period 200 years ago. And the property was acquired by a director of BP, who was a geologist exploring in Papua New Guinea, made great discoveries of oil, which made him very wealthy, and a director of BP. And his hobby was collecting wonderful art. So this house is filled with art from all over the world, and the stable is filled with Papua New Guinea sculptures, 200 pieces, a 5 million US dollar collection. So when you come to Barbados, I'll take you there. This is another Georgian, Caribbean Georgian house, Clinton Hall Great House. A friend of mine restored this house recently, and it's a fascinating house. Notice the arcades, and notice that this veranda surrounds the Georgian mansion on three sides with its arches. It has a hip roof with several, several hips going back. It's a very large house of about eight to 10,000 square feet. Not sure the exact area. This is a view from the other side. The the, the original picture. That's a, a, a pen and wash um, painting of mine, and this is the actual current. That's 25 years old. This is the current view of the house after restoration, and you see the Palladian front porch, and you see the arcades and the veranda surrounding it, and then you see a house, marshlands and Beaufort, the home of Dr. James Verdier, also built in the early 19th century which has been extensively and repeatedly described as resembling the plantation houses of Barbados. Well, I leave you to judge. The description of this house is set high from the ground on a tabby arcade, the tabby being, for those who are not familiar, the, uh, the mortar that was made from, from grinding up and, and, and uh, cooking, if you like, the, the oyster shells. The two-story house gives evidence of Barbadian influence in the single-story veranda that runs the length of and to the sides. This West Indian influence, and he goes on, and then he says, the sheet metal roof, a galvanized iron sheet metal roof, is painted red and the shutters are dark green. And do you know that every single plantation house in Barbados, when I was a boy, fifth, oh, 10 years ago, um, every single plantation house in Barbados was painted with a red roof, green shutters, and cream colored walls. Every single one. There was not one that was not painted in that way. So that's a remarkable coincidence on the color. I leave you to judge whether the inference is that strong. Here's another one, though, that again, in the literature, has been described as a source of the imitation of Carolinian houses. But this house is actually 1800. So, you know, um, some of the houses that they say resemble Barbadian houses, 
Uh, hard to be sure, but there is again another house with the arcades on the seventh floor and the veranda running around the house on three sides. Of course, in Charleston you have these magnificent mansions, and we don't have many of them. The, the, the pedimented front to your buildings, which are so popular, and the splendid curved double staircases. We got those double staircases too, but you know, we were copying Adams and the English architects. There's a lovely house, the Malvern Great House, with a lovely curved double staircase. Verandas running around, all around the first floor, and this house has has a hurricane shelter with walls three feet thick, octagonal, built like a fortress at the back of the house. Now, let's move on. This last Caribbean Georgian picture is a state hostel. At least I think it is, and most of us think it is. Uh, we haven't proven it yet because we haven't done the archaeological dig. And uh, Mike Stoner, where is he? Where are you, Mike? Where are you, Mike? Um, I have here about 100 witnesses. Will you promise to do the dig on this building? <laughs> Yes, but this, this I think is a slave hospital in Barbados. And then the next phase is the post-garrison period. The garrison began to be built up in Barbados because of the great increase in the French war threat. So in 1780 the British came in. Now, people do things in various ways and administrators are inexplicable. But what actually happened is that the battalion arrived in Barbados and nobody had any warning. So they had to put them on all sorts of places. But they then set about building wonderful barrack buildings. So we have a garrison in Barbados, about 141 acres, built close to a promontory and to Carlisle Bay, and one mile and a bit from the capital of Bridgetown. And this site of this garrison, together with our Bridgetown, has just been inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, historic Bridgetown and its garrison. The garrison has almost 100 structures on it. Uh, a few are small structures like wells and the trees and cookhouses, but most of them are large barrack buildings like the one you see on this slide. This block C has been somewhat remodeled and restored by the Town and Country Planning Office. Uh, parts of the restoration are well done, some are not so well done, but it's a wonderful example of adaptive use so that you have an old barrack building which has been adapted. Now you notice the Georgian arches, which became so popular in Barbados, and you notice the double staircase, the Palladian double staircase to a grand entrance on the upper floor. And this was copied widely across Barbados, so that many, many houses were built. Now, the cellars below and all the wonderful living rooms on the upper floor, some of them with bedrooms downstairs, but you had to have the upper floor rooms with this grand double staircase. If you didn't have a double staircase and a pedimented porch, then you were nobody. And we put this one with the double staircase on the cover of my book, Historic Houses of Barbados. And this is another wonderful post garrison house. The, the last post garrison building I want to show you is the Tangiri Prison. This is perhaps the most magnificent building in all of Barbados. 1854-55 and extended with uh, a, a much bigger block to the back of this west wing. But this west wing has 72 arches, the three bay uh, pavilion style, three story pedimented central portion with staircases in the chapel and uh, two rows, three rows on each side of 12 arches, 72 arches, and each arch subtends a cell. The cell is only 7 feet wide, 13 feet long. Uh, I've been into the interesting prison here that's been wonderfully adapted for reuse as a college of building arts. That is a fantastic project, and I'm going to go home and write about that. But this is our Glendary prison, and I'm looking for sponsors and partners and capital investors because we want to make this 14 acre site for these magnificent buildings into the best prison museum and multifaceted entertainment center anywhere. There are 40 prison museums in the US of A. There are 24 in Britain. There's Robins Island in South Africa. People know about Alcatraz and Sing Sing and so on. And people love it. And now I know about the ones in Charleston. People love prisons. And every state in the USA which has a prison except for competing with Disney World and Niagara Falls, they're the highest number of visitors on most sites. They get hundreds of thousands of visitors every year. So I have partners at this prison. Uh, you can get my email afterwards and just let me know how much you want to contribute. Church architecture. 
Now, we have a St. Michael's Cathedral, you have a St. Michael's Church on the corner of the four corners of the law. We have a St. Peter's Parish Church in Spikestown, and people have drawn similarities between the design of this and a church here in Charleston. I forget which one. But the point I want to make is that in the 18th century, when the churches were being rebuilt after the 1780 hurricane, Georgian style was at its height. So the churches rebuilt after the great 1780 hurricane were all built in Georgian style. Lovely arched windows and doors with fan lights, Palladian entrances, dentils, parapet roofs, the works. There is a pure Georgian building, is it not? Well, guess what? In 1869, Gothic revival was strong. And some of these Georgian churches, they didn't have chancels. Most Georgian churches didn't have either a tower or a chancel at the two ends. They often had this pediment at the front, and some of them had a spire like St. Martin's in the fields, and most of the American churches were Georgian in design with a spire. Well, here in Barbados in the 1860s, they went around building Gothic revival chapels on the back of all the Georgian churches. And Gothic architecture, of course, which is described as in this pointy-pointy architecture. So here's your pointed arch with your lovely uh, tracery with windows and a very steep pointed gable with a little cross at the top and so on. And here is another beautiful Georgian church which was planned and designed. The bishop arrived, the first bishop in 1825, the first bishop in the English-speaking Caribbean, and he laid the cornerstone in five months of his arrival. Georgian building, beautiful design, Georgian's high style. But he said, no, 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 we've got to have a castellated tower. And so there's a castellated tower on this building. And then Gothic really came in. And this bishop came from Oxford. Now, Oxford was the center of medieval Gothic architecture and of church architecture for its colleges and its churches. And this was said to be his favorite church. So here's a lovely Gothic church with its castellations and its pointed windows. And here is a side view of this church with its lovely pointed finials. So I think we can all agree that Gothic is pointed. Mike is gone. I wonder why. Rob, can you rest to us? Uh, shout until Mike, until Rob comes. So here is a pure Gothic church. And this bishop was an amazing man. He persuaded everyone to give land for the churches. And so here today, when I went out with Mayor Might in Goose Creek, and I saw the fantastic St. James Church, and a few miles away, the St. James Church Chapel of Ease. Well, our Bishop Coleridge came to Barbados and said, 12 churches, no way that's enough for 160,000 people, slaves who are going to be freed. We've got to build churches. So he built in 18 years 22 churches half of which got demolished in a hurricane, and he had to rebuild them. This man was a builder of everything. And he built all these chapels of ease. And I was interested because my, Mayor Mike to me today told us that he wasn't aware of the term chapel of ease being used anywhere else in the U.S. of A. But it was in use in Barbados a hundred years later because your chapel of ease here at St. James was built in 1715. And Bishop Porter was building our chapels of ease in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. So we have all these Gothic chapels of ease. Moving on, the only use of Gothic was for church buildings and our parliament buildings. Gothic was just regarded as too precious, too godly for houses. So although all over Europe and parts of North America, Gothic was used in building houses, there is only one Gothic house in Barbados. These are our parliament buildings, which I enjoy every time I go into the Senate. Really beautiful buildings. Now let's switch to posting on stone. These are rubble stone slave huts. And although this has a galvanized iron sheet roof, it would have had thatch or cane trash. But notice this slave hut is built with Georgian symmetry. You could not build a house in Barbados without a central front door and a window on each side. People would have said, what are you, an idiot? So it had to be done that way. And the picture down bottom right, and these are all Bob Kiss's wonderful photos that are at the City Gallery and in our book. And the one bottom right is shown. He took that picture because it was so dilapidated it had been abandoned for years. He felt it was going to disappear. And that's a single chattel house. 
12 or 14 feet wide, 8 or 10 feet deep, a single gable roof, and it would have been divided into two rooms, as would the straight path have been. And this is another house showing two houses put together to form a two-unit house. And you notice this is built with the pine boards, very symmetrical, not like the old Jamaican ones. And this one has a galvanized roof. And you notice it's on loose stones. Now, in the Bible, who reads the Bible? I won't embarrass you. It speaks often of a man's goods and his chattels. The chattels are the things he can move about. And in the old days, in fact, the slaves were regarded as chattels because they were bought, they were sold, and they were moved about along with his possessions. So the chattel house was designed that it could be moved around. Because in slavery, when slavery ended in Jamaica and Trinidad, many of the slaves went off into the mountains. They said, we've had enough of this. We're going to make our life in the mountains and create their own life, plant, live on herbs and berries perhaps, dig and plant and live. In Barbados, there was no room because remember I told you how tiny we are. So the planters were very clever. They worked out an accommodation of four years of apprenticeship so that the slaves could practice being free, but really to bind them as cheap labor to the plantations. And they paid them very little. But the slave might get wise, and his friend down the road might tell him, well, you know, John Brown is a better employer. He's a kinder manager. Come live here. So the slave had to be able to pick up his house and move it. So a house like this, two units, the front section would have had three walls, the back section three walls, the wall in between is seven walls. They were all built as a piece. Early prefabricated houses. And then you had the four bits of the roof and the two bits of the floor. So you had, you had 11 pieces of wood and you stacked them on the long scar and down the road and the long scar. Okay, and then some other car would have taken the stones, so they would have been pretty heavy. All those stones would have been piled up. And you would have moved a house in a day. You know, think of the year that it takes sometimes to build a mansion that you might have built with your architect friend. You know, a year to build that. This would remove your house and relocate you in a day. And this is another chapel house, and this is a larger one, and you can see the roof, the section at the back is more cheaply built. That is what is called a lean to or a shed roof because it has a simple sort of roof to take off the water. In this case, there are hip roofs, and in this case, both the walls and the wood are made with shingles. But what I want you to look at here is the development of style. This house has window hoods to keep the rain off. It has side panels that open out. The door has jealousies, which are movable flaps. And remember, jealousy comes from the French word, which means jealousy. It means that you could open the jealousy and peep through to see whether you wanted to let the person outside in. It also meant that you could move the jealousy, if you were a jealous lover, to see whether someone was doing what they should be doing. So that's why it's called the jealousy. And these houses uniformly had jealousy windows and doors to let the ventilation in. So that for security in the days before Rod Aaron, you simply locked your door, but you left your jealousy windows open and the breeze came in. And that was important too for resisting hurricanes. Because houses, houses collapse because of the dramatic change in barometric pressure. And if you got jealousies, then the barometric pressure is kept equal throughout the house. So the jealousy door keeps the strong wind out, but it equalizes the pressure. So from all of those points of view, although this picture which shows a house with a cloudy sky and it's called stormy sky, the house is little, the house is built of wood, it's not built of a fortress, but it has some flexibility in the wind, the steep roofs at 45 degrees deflect the wind, and the jealousies keep the pressures equal. And so these wooden houses often survive better than modern concrete block houses. And this is a really elegant chapel house. You see the beautiful portico with the fretwork to decorate it. You see the finials. This is the only hint of Gothic. The pointy bits, the decorated bits of wood that stick up in the air, reaching up for God. You see the hoods of the windows. And these hoods are curved. These are called bell palmets because they're curved like a bell, so they're very pretty. And you see the boards at the side of the gable end. They're called barge boards. And they've got fretwork designs just like the fretwork on the French of the portico. And then you see the back 
section, the kitchen and bathroom in this modern house, which is actually this house was built in 1925. And I spoke to the lovely lady about this house about 20 years ago. Her husband was a carpenter and built this house for their marriage. And she lived in this house since she was married for about 60 years. And there's the stone section at the back of the door, which is the kitchen leading onto the bathroom. Now, we at the National Trust had an opportunity of creating a heritage village. And because these houses are subject to termite, and if, if we built them on loose stones and a hurricane came along, then it might have been blown off the foundation, and that wouldn't be good. So what we got was, what we did was to get my architect friend to go out and photograph and measure carefully all of the most beautiful houses of different styles that were chattel houses. And he came back and designed these chattel houses to illustrate the different architectural styles. So here's one with lovely bell cabinets and a lovely portico and balustrades at the, at the port entrance. And you see that the second unit of the house is wider than the front because you would have a big living room at the front and then a corridor going through the back section so that there's a room on each side. And by making the house wider, you can accommodate your corridor to separate rooms of privacy and you've got room to have a window at the front of that bedroom. So you have a window on the front of the side and you cater to ventilation. And for those who really, really want to keep the window shut, there's even a little window at the top of the gable end. Now, that wouldn't do much for ventilation, but it would equalize the pressure. And this is a house with a shingle roof at our Tyrrell Court Heritage Village. So this is a replica at our Heritage Village. Another replica with a veranda right around it at the Heritage Village. A Tyrrell Court Village House, another replica. And these are three of them in color, showing three chapel houses, each with a different style of veranda. So you can walk around the Chattel House Village just like Colonial Williamsburg, and you can see this variety of houses. You can see our, our slave hut, our replica built of stone with a trash roof. You can see our blacksmith shop. You can see the little Chattel House Museum and so on. What is happening to the Chattel House which was disappearing, and which is why Bob was taking these photos in the first place, we thought there'd be none by the beginning of the 21st century. But people started to recognize their importance. People started to be proud of them. People stopped letting them decay. And then they started to build new ones. They started to convert them into shops and bars and hair salons and barber saloons and fashion places. And all over the West Coast, there are chattel houses which are now used as business places of one kind or another. And people are now building new houses. And this is a brand new chattel house, about four years old. Uh, this is the, just north the Strathclyde on, uh, on um, forget the, name of the, the road. But it's a wonderful house built of very, very lovely timber, exactly like an old chapel house. Now, the chapel houses influence the big houses. The Georgian architecture influenced the chapel houses so that everyone in Barbados built a house that was symmetrical, okay? But they, in turn, then got bigger and bigger and bigger. And so they, in turn, influenced the, the villa the middle class house, the school teacher's house, the policeman's house. And so you have these little villas which are like larger chattel houses, some built with entirely wood, some with stone and wood, and some with stone. And this introduces another interesting element here, the stone parapet. There was a, an agreement, a legal requirement, that houses in a certain area, a certain suburb, etc., in 1890, had to have stone walls. So they got away from this by building a stone parapet that joined the front of the house with the back of the house. And usually the back of the house is built entirely of wood. And the stone parapet is the foundation and this curved wall at the front. And I call that the Barbadian parapet because that scallop parapet is unique to Barbados. And so Bayesian vernacular then is the synthesis of all of these different styles coming together. And this is another picture from my book of a beautiful villa that is now adapted as a doctor's office. And this one too, a lovely villa, also adapted. And we come to the 20th century, post-World War I. This is our theater, the Empire Theater, which is now in ruin. This, of course, is an edited photograph. And this wonderful theater was designed by the wife of a governor, who was a Bostonian trained in art and architecture, and came back to Barbados for their retirement home, and she did wonderful things in Barbados, and she designed this great theater, which has now been empty for 30 years, and we're trying to get it restored. But this is a kind of post-Edwardian 
design. She was trained in the uh, early Edwardian, but she was trained really in the late Victorian era with people like Lukians influenced her designs. And so this building is 1919. And then again, we have our special vernacular designs. This is a classic Barbadian house of the interwar period of the 1930s with its sacred veranda posts, always a veranda at the front of the house, its jealousy doors, its thick roof. Classic, standard, and this is a rather grander version of the Bayesian vernacular built in the early 1940s. We come now to the modern era, and we're a bit ambivalent about architecture. Anything goes. So here is a house that you might well think was built in 1820 or 30. It's a absolute copy of an early 19th century Barbados plantation house built about five years ago. You see the Georgian design, the cemetery development, the portico, the power plant, etc. On the other hand, many modern architects feel that they've got to put everything into the picture. So here is a modern commercial complex with about seven or eight or nine or ten or fifteen design elements. All different, a bit of this, a bit of that. It's a kind of potpourri a kind of carnival building, it's got just about everything except OG arches. And this is one of the latest, most vulgar buildings that has been built in Barbados, an office block that, we, that replaced an absolutely magnificent 1915 building. Uh, on the other hand, there are those who are evoking the Bernat. So this is a, a, a high-end sugar hill complex uh, associated near to a golf course and so on. Uh, in which the, the best of uh, Victorian has come through, and this is a design which won one of our National Trust Architectural Awards last year. And this is another winner. This is a garrison building called the Pavilion, in which officers lived, which was restored, and this too received the National Trust 50th Anniversary Award. So it's the building built in, in 1805, restored almost 200 years later, absolutely beautifully after a fire. And I finish, therefore, with the iconic structure that symbolizes the main guard of the garrison. This is the uh, Sir Christopher Wren type uh, clock tower of the main guard. You can see the tower and the clock, which has been restored. And this is the centerpiece where court marshals were done at the center of the whole garrison complex. And the people absolutely love this building with its cannon in front. People love tall, straight, erect objects. I won't go any further on that note. But this is really symbolizing the beautiful garrison that is so unique, the biggest garrison in the whole British Empire, one of the finest garrisons, possibly in a sense artistically, aesthetically, historically, and architecturally, perhaps one of the very finest military installations anywhere in its 140 acres, with a fortification of forts, a dance fort, a shot tower, a signal tower, and a fort along the sea where there was a battery uh, along the edge and this was the fort which defended Barbados and the only time we were invaded by a foreign power, the Dutch, uh, back in the 17th century. So with that um, brief summary and 50 pictures or so, that's the architectural history. I am trying to show you the areas where we might have influenced architecture in the Carolinas <coughs> through the single house and through the plantation house in the 17th and 18th centuries. I hope I've stimulated you, and I hope I've shown you enough to show you that those people who have, in an era of judgment, not yet visited Barbados, should be <laughs> over the next few months. Thank you very, very much. We have just a few minutes, maybe just a few questions for five minutes or so, Dr. Fraser. Yes, ma'am. I'll take you on a tour tomorrow if you'll take me on a tour of <laughs> I wish I could accept your invitation, but I leave tomorrow morning early. Delay. But just let me know when you're coming to Barbados, and I'll be happy to take you on a tour. I do, I do occasional rich down historic tours, and I do plantation, great house, and church tours for very special people. The first slide that you did um, is, is almost an
their timbers, their roofs are all built with bullet wood joined together with dowels. And it's perfect wood. It's in perfect condition. Thank you. Some people, of course, think that the best thing about Barbados is our wonderful run. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's all for people. So, thank you very much for coming. Appreciate you coming out. <laughs> you know it's true, I told it is a ready birthday. I'm taking this time out to say happy birthday to all my people in Barbados. All my fans, all my loved ones. Let me say, 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 let me say